here in Cooksville, no matter how decrepit the structure, people tend to not throw anything away. Cooksville is a very special community outside of Janesville. The entire village is on the National Register of Historic Places. I'm with one of the residents, Jennifer Ely. And Jennifer, you have one of the, the oldest homes in Cooksville? Correct. This is considered the oldest house in Rock County that was built as a home that is still being built still being used as a home. And you were blessed with some decrepit structures Correct. on your property when you moved here. Correct. The irony of this is when we moved into our house, we had no indoor plumbing, but we had two outhouses. Well, lucky you. Yes, I know. <laughs> and this is now, this is not still functioning as an no, outhouse. No, no, no. I'm going to check. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it looks more like a kind of a garden storage shed. Correct. Uh, the interesting part about this is, at least from my point of view as a gardener, it looks to me like you've made this the focal point of your, this, this area of your garden. Yes, we have. This was a very shaded area. We needed something with some height, something that would pop. So we created a color scheme that would attract the eyes. I've never heard of anybody restoring an outhouse, but it works. <laughs> That's right. Now you have two of them, so you've, we have done this, you've done quite a bit of work with this. Correct. Now you, you've also got some plants in this area yes. that really work well as part of this outhouse garden scheme. Correct. Well, again, we're working in a shade area, so we have um, some lilies that we planted. These are called Lily Speciosum album, mm -hmm. and we also have a quick hydrangea, quick fire hydrangea, excuse me. And these are shade plants mm -hmm. with some sun. And this quick fire hydrangea is a really special hydrangea, isn't it? Correct. It was. It made the top um, 20 list of kind of surefire hydrangeas, indestructible, which, which makes my list. Yeah, anything indestructible goes onto yes. my list. Correct. Now, another theme that I see throughout um, the gardens here is, is metal. Correct. Uh, we live next door to the Cooksville Blacksmith Shop. It is a working blacksmith oh, shop. Wow. And Dr. Tom Evermore did a lot of his sculpture work over here at the Blacksmith Shop. Kind so of we, a famous sculptor of metal. Correct. So um, we just felt like there had to be one in Cooksville, so we purchased one of them. That one is of in the yard. beautiful big birds. That's correct. And yes. then other pieces look like they've just maybe walked across the correct. backyard. Um, <laughs> yes, we've become good friends with Dr. Evermore's son, and my friend and I have a good eye for what could be good artwork. So we have purchased, borrowed, a number of pieces. Well, and you've got the other um, uh, outhouse was quite quite more effort. Let's go take a look at that. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now this is fun. I mean, a pink outhouse as the focal point of a garden. I didn't think it would work, but it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now this one, the, the, the other one, just a coat of paint. This one is the one that cost you. <laughs> yes. This one required a major amount of work. I mean, we're talking carpenters, we're talking cement guys. Rebuilding. Rebuilding the entire building. What did it cost you? About 2000 Wow. Now, some people would probably look a little funny at that, but again, I mean, this makes you smile when you come by. This That's is, right. Now, you have a beautiful flower bed here. Mm -hmm. Would a, a functioning outhouse have plants historically planted around it? Correct. Very many. They would have had plants that would have counteracted the negative smell from the outhouse. Ah, okay. So they would have had lilacs, they would have had morning glories, they would have had um, hollyhocks, which became known as outhouse roses. Really? Yes. Okay. Yep. So they, they, they were there for a purpose. Exactly. Well, your bed is great again. I mean, the colors make that pink pop and they just work so well together. Yes. Yep. And, and these, uh, I see that, uh, the, some of the colors kind of repeated behind you. Very much so. Some of the plants were selected and some have just migrated from the prairie behind us. So we are very pleased with this borrowed view behind us that we are very thankful for. And that was one of the terms that we learned about in the Master Gardening class also was borrowed views. You enhance what you have. Sure. If somebody grew a prairie behind you, take advantage of it. That's right. That's right. You know, we need to talk about the fact that, that you're not the only person pushing out houses in Cooksville. <laughs> Correct. I have a good friend named Erlene Hansen, who um, is a good gardening friend. She's somebody that 
picks out um, color schemes with me, helps me decide what plants I want to have, but she also shares the experience. So I and, recommend a friend. And the two of you together kind of changed the face of um, outhouse gardening in Cooksville. Well, I think people are realizing that there is a benefit and a purpose for having other structures in your yard, whether they're functional structures, whether they're part of your garden, overall garden scheme, but there or are just people. pure whimsy. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for sharing this, and, and I'm grateful to have been privy to this tour. <laughs> You're welcome. The streets of most American cities used to be lined with gorgeous elm trees providing a lot of beautiful shade. Well, that's a thing of the past. I'm with UW Extension plant pathologist Brian Huddleston to talk about why that's a thing of the past. Yeah, again, like you said, we used to have a lot of elm trees along the streets of America, and unfortunately there was a fungal disease that came in and basically has uh, killed most of the elms, certainly in the eastern United States and certainly here in the Madison area in Wisconsin. So Decimated is a good word to decimated use. Decimated is a great word to use for that. It's uh, what's called a vascular wilt disease, which are some of the toughest ones to deal with from a control standpoint. The fungus actually enters in typically into a tree through bark beetles that bring in the fungus. It colonizes the water conducting tissue. That's called the vascular tissue in the tree and it blocks it off. So any point above yeah. that, that point on the tree will not get water from the root system. So in a vascular, you have an example then of how of the water being blocked off. Right, the water conducting tissue is right underneath the bark and when this fungus infects the trees, it will cause a browning of that particular tissue and that's what I use as a visual cue when I'm doing a diagnostic in my clinic. Well, where does Dutch elm come from? I mean, I think Dutch is the key right. word right there. And that's more from the fact that it arrived in Europe before it arrived in the United States, and there was a lot of initial work that was done by the Dutch on the disease. But the fungus actually originates, people think, in Asia. And if you look at where there's resistance to the disease, it tends to be an Asiatic species of elms. And this hit our American elms about when? Around the 1920s here in the United States, a little bit later here in Wisconsin, because it took some time to travel from the East Coast into the middle part of the country. Well, we're, we're, we are walking along one of the uh, many bike paths in Madison because there's some really good examples of That's this right. disease People here. don't think there are a lot of elms left, but there are actually a lot of volunteers that have grown up, and there's certainly a lot along this bike path. And uh, some of the symptoms I've been seeing in the trees around here, the elm trees, is flagging, which is an initial, initial symptom where you tend to see uh, individual branches start to die back. Usually, so out at the outer edges? Like? Yeah, usually from the tip back down towards the trunk, and oftentimes that's where the uh, bark beetles will enter into the tissue. They'll do some feeding, drop off the fungus there, and then it colonizes back into the main trunk. It'll eventually move down into the root system, colonize the entire tree, and then it'll do what it's done here, which is kill the entire tree. So when we see a tree in, well, okay, when we see a tree that has flagging, right. is there anything we can do to stop it at that point? Usually at that point, it's a lost cause. Really? Because, Even that early? Right. When you're seeing those visual cues, that usually means that the fungus is not only in the branch that you're looking at, but also way down in the trunk, which means it's, there's no real way to treat the tree. So we usually recommend removal in that particular case. So you, there's no cure, basically? No cure. There are some preventative treatments. If you have, for example, a really nice uh, showcase elm in your front yard that you want to try to protect, there are fungicide treatments that you would inject into the base of the tree. As a preventative? That's a preventative. It helps prevent the, okay. the tree from becoming infected. And these are not easy treatments to do, so you really need to get a certified arborist to come and do that. Okay. Once you have a symptomatic tree, it's an issue of removal. And uh, if you have a cluster of trees, you've got to ver be very careful to break what are called root grass. It's where the roots of various trees have fused together underground because the fungus can move from tree to tree that way. So that tree is a hazard. That is a hazard both from potentially moving to other elms in the area underground and also the insects that can move the fungus around could revisit that tree, pick up the fungus, and then move on to other elms. Okay, so it, it, it I mean, it's an inoculant right now, basically. It can, it can spread it even though it's dead or in a doornail. That's right. Now I have, um, I live along a bike path as mm -hmm. well, and on the proper, the bike path property are three trees with no bark right. whatsoever, and they're elms. Okay. Are they a hazard? I wouldn't worry about those, because once the trees debark, lose their bark, then I would not expect the Dutch elm disease fungus to be active at that point. So they're just 
dead and ugly, but they're not something I'm going to have to panic about. Uh, no, and actually I would check around the base of those for morels because oftentimes you find morels growing oh. at the base of dead elm trees. Okay, so they might be worth keeping around for a little while. Yes, for a little while. What about planting um, um, elm trees that are resistant? Definitely, there, that's an option. There are some very resistant uh, varieties that are hybrids between American elms and Asiatic species of elms. They usually don't have the real nice vase sort of form that of an American. shape, yeah. Yeah, they're more like a typical tree. Um, but there are also uh, true American elms that have been bred for resistance. There's an Independence elm, an American Liberty elm, a Valley Forge elm, the Princeton elm. There are several varieties that are available. I wouldn't grow a lot of those because even those elms, although they're resistant, they aren't immune, which means they can get the disease. So take good care of them, maybe use the preventative treatment, and make sure they're not stressed because that just helps their resistance. That's right, and just uh, make sure you're only planting one here or there. Don't do a monoculture like we used to along our streets where it was all the same tree. Which is why Elm Street no longer has any elms. That's true. Okay, thanks, Brian. You're welcome. If I saw these anywhere near me, I would run for the hills. These are the scariest looking wasp-like thing I've ever seen. We are at Allen Centennial Gardens on the UW-Madison campus, and I'm with UW Extension entomologist Phil Pelletieri to hopefully give us good news about these monsters. Yeah, <laughs> this is kind of a special treat if you really want to think oh, really? about it that way. <laughs> Critters are called cicada killers, and uh, they are a type of solitary wasp they remind you of the biggest yellow jacket you've ever seen. Oh yeah. But the name really describes much more what they're about. And uh, these cicada things go killers. around and attack cicadas, which are the, the creatures that start buzzing in the trees in the middle of July through August. That kind of raspy noise, especially late in the afternoon. Right, and uh, what they need to do is dig a burrow into the ground. And they will dig a burrow as deep as five to seven inches. Wow. And then they will go, the female will paralyze the cicada. She has to fly with it or drag it, whichever she can do bury it in the ground, lay her egg, and one of the fascinating things about their biology is if she puts one cicada in the hole, she will lay an egg that's not fertilized that will transform into a male. Okay. If she puts two cicadas in the hole, she then will lay an egg that is fertilized that will transform into a female. So the females get special treatment, makes right. sense to me. <laughs> now, the way the life cycle works, this is what we would call a solitary wasp. This is not a nest. Once she provisions it and lays her egg, she has nothing to do with it. And why this is important is solitary wasps are not aggressive because there's no nest to defend. So she doesn't stick around to, to, to raise these or to protect these, these eggs? No. Okay. Now, here's where the complication is. It's big, it's scary looking. Yeah. If you're in an area where these are found, the males are very territorial and they literally patrol back and forth to keep other males out and they're looking for a female that's emerging and they're gonna mate with her as quick as they can. That's part of their biology. So the territory is more just to hang out there looking for the female. There again, right. there's nothing they're protecting. Now they use landmarks to figure out where the territory is. And, okay. and what the mistake is, if you walk into the area, you're a new landmark and they're very curious. And so people misread this as being an aggressive behavior. And so, you know, people go screaming and yelling. They have giant yep. wasps that are nesting in their house and they're gonna <laughs> kill the kids. And this is not the way this thing works at all. Now, first of all, the males can't sting. They can't. No, which is typical with bees. I, oh. You know, males have no reason to have stingers. Stingers are basically modified egg-laying devices. And oh. if you're a male, you don't lay eggs. That's true. So the females. Even with the females, you would have to tackle one of these to get stung, and it's not going to happen because you'll notice they fly very well, and they'll fly away from you. you know, they're not so gonna they're, put they're up just not interested in us, right. basically. Right. Now, okay. fun to talk about the cicada life cycle. Okay. okay, well let's bring them in because they're also, I happen to think, very, very beautiful, right. very primitive looking. This one is what we would call the dog day cicada and it really fits with the July and August. They're out in the late summer. Um, they are often associated, I think, of when it's time for the kids to go back to school because that's yeah. about the time it overlaps. So, it's a, so good, this is the prey. it's a good news bug. <laughs> right, this is the prey and honestly this one was stung by a cicada killer. Really? Uh, and this is what she'd have to drag and, and put into the burrow. Wow. Now, this has a three-year life cycle but there are dog day cicadas that come out all every year and so we always right. have some right what people confuse this with is the 17 year cicadas which we have in the southeastern part of the state and they only come out once every 17 years That's and kind of we're the not big emergence right. so cicada killers don't attack 17 year cicadas because it takes 17 years before your next meal comes by that doesn't work yeah but it works very well for these now the fascinating thing to me is as a young entomologist we did not have this cicada killers in the state really i would tell people we'd have to go to indianapolis to find them 
but with the mild winters that we've been having lately, they have moved northward. And so we have cicada killers in the southern part of the state from basically Wisconsin Dale south. But you need light soils to find these. So sandy kind of areas more likely. You don't find them in heavy clays and the like. So they can be very much localized. But if you have them in the right area, I mean, you can see 15, 20 flying at once between the males, the females, wow. and the like. And as I said, that's what people misread. So these guys are digging their burrows in light soils, not heavy clay. Right. Um, no. I, can I find them in my garden then? If, if it's bare soil, you don't okay. find them in mulched areas, you don't find them in heavy vegetation. Okay. And so that's one of the things that people can do to keep them away. We sometimes get them in flower beds or, or in planters. There, oh. a, 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 what somebody could do if they don't want to put the mulch on it is put a piece of landscape fabric. These won't be able they to dig through it, okay. so they'll move on to somewhere else, but yet you'll get the water through. So that's another adjustment. So as good gardeners, we of course are all mulching, so we shouldn't have a problem. Right, and we don't normally suggest to treat these. If somebody absolutely insisted, I want to get rid of them, the appropriate way is to dust the burrows. Use a dust in the burrows. But as okay. I said, if you look at their biology, you can easily make the argument, why do you have to kill them? Right, they're not, and they're not harming anything else. And no, other than the cicadas, and there will always be cicadas around. They'll never get all of them. So, so it's not a problem. Don't run. Just don't worry about them. Right. Thanks, Phil. We are at Green Bay Botanical Gardens in one of their classrooms to learn about Ikebana. I am with Kazuko Bressler, who is on the board of directors for Green Bay Botanical Gardens, and you are also an instructor in Ikebana. Yes. Um, please, tell me what that is. Uh, Ikebana is the Japanese art of arranging flowers in accordance with rules and principle uh, set over many centuries. So it's a very ancient yes, art. Yes, it is a very old art. Uh, we can categorize Ikebana into three categories, uh, basics and classics and uh, contemporary ones. Okay, and, yeah. and when, give, give me a timeline. How, how, where did this begin? Uh, the first Ikebana school was established in 1500s. Okay, so really. And uh, however, uh, the origin of that school goes way back into sixth century. Wow, so they've had a long time to develop these rules and these styles. Yes. So classics would be the oldest? Yes, classic would be the oldest. Well, you've got a number of arrangements here done by you and some of your students. So let's start out and take a, a trip through history. Yes, let's. Uh, the first arrangement here is called a rika. Rika is consists of nine uh, major lines with many helpers to enhance the arrangement. Actually, this rika represents a landscape of Tonko, China. And this was, uh, uh, so this is a ver the very oldest style. Yes. And they were uh, bringing back uh, the a monk who went to Tonko, China to study Buddhism, he did oh. not have a camera. <laughs> no. So he came back, uh, decided to create the flower arrangement so he, to he... show the landscape oh, okay. of Tonko, China. Okay. And a tourist branch, you can see, is a tourist mountain, uh, cascading willow branches are the mountain range below that, and also the winter berries, uh, another mountain. And the center of the arrangement, irises and mums and greeneries represent the village oh, okay. of Tonko. And then the uh, lines that uh, goes to the front uh, represents the river uh, going into an uh, ocean. So this is all symbolism of, of a real place. Yes. Wow, and it's beautiful too. Now, this is also still part of the classic Yes, this is called the nageire. Um, nageire means throw in flowers. <laughs> uh, it, was, it is very informal arrangement. Okay. We put a lot of emphasis on treating the material uh, the way they grow. So burning bush, things that we might find yes. in nature naturally. Mm -hmm. Now, are the vases themselves significant? Yes, the vases, like this vase, is a thin and tall vase mm -hmm. we call shin, shin vase. Okay, yeah. and this one then 
is completely different. It's it's tall, but it's not thin. Uh, no, uh, the opening is wider than uh, uh, shin base. We call it gyo base. Okay. And uh, this arrangement actually come from Rika. It was created in 1700s, uh, and uh, uh, characteristic of this arrangement is that a uh, whole arrangement emerges from a one point so it's all in coming. the vase. Okay. And uh, it has three major lines, Shin and, and the a torus line, okay. and Soye, the second mm -hmm. torus lines, and a short line called Tai. And these three lines have a focal point that you can create triangle when oh. you connect them. So there? Yes. And then there? Yes. Now, is that triangle the basis for all of the arrangements in Ikebana? Yes. Okay, I just discovered a basic premise. Yes. Okay, and then we're moving into more modern styles yes. of arrangements. This is late 1800s. Okay. Uh, this arrangement was created uh, late 1800s and when Paris expo Exposition was held in uh, oh. Paris, France, and a, a Japanese government was asked to uh, represent, uh, present some Japanese uh, culture. Oh, wonderful. And so uh, Moribana was created. Moribana means two pied flowers <laughs> in a base. So more uh, casual again. Yeah, it is a very casual and uh, we create the miniature garden in the vase. And this is a different container entirely than the other two we looked at. That's true. And uh, opening is much wider okay. and uh, lower. And what is this called? It's called a soul style vase. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then this, this one I really like. This is, this is just beautiful. I love the horse tails. Yeah. Next one is uh, we call this arrangement freestyle. And it was created after Second World War. Okay. Because uh, there are a lot of materials coming into Japan by air. And also lifestyle of Japanese are changing. And this arrangement, uh, you use lime materials and dot materials, area materials. And you combine those lines, that area material to create the arrangement. Well, and we should mention these are meant to be viewed from the front yes, and against a blank a, a, a wall. We're back here just to help illustrate these. Mm -hmm. And then now we're moving into modern times? Yes, this arrangement was created in 1970s okay. uh, by headmaster of Ikenobo School. Uh, this is a shoka, uh, like a classic shoka when you see the uh, arrangement. It emerges from, from the, one the point in base. the base. However, we use more materials. Oh, now in you're this allowed one. to be okay. Much freer than the classic material uh, okay. the arrangements. And the, the plants are beautiful. And again, we have that triangle happening. Yes. You know, I really want to learn more about this. Um, you hold a show at Green Bay Botanical Gardens in March. Yes. And uh, we will also have more information on Ikebana on our website. Thank you. Thank you, because we go. Well, I think I found yet another hobby, or maybe two. <laughs> For more information on Ikebana, please check out our website at wpt.org, then click on the Wisconsin Gardener.
I'm Shelley Ryan. Thanks for watching. Funding for the Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association. We are in Longenecker Gardens at UW-Madison Arboretum to talk about climate change, something that affects all of us. I am with Michael Notero, and Michael is the Associate Director at the Nelson Center for Climactic Research. And I said that right, right? Yes. And that's at part of the UW-Madison. Yes. Uh, and I think we should start by defining what climate change is. I, you know, you hear everything from global warming to the new ice age, and it's something in between those two, I think. Yeah, I think <laughs> that's right. The climate change is a better term than global warming because climate change really involves more than warming, but changes in weather patterns, changes in snow and ice, the entire system. So the patterns are changing. That's right. And we also want to differentiate between climate and weather. We can, as an example, this past winter of 2011-12, um, we had about six degrees above normal temperatures. March was about 14 degrees above normal. Um, so we have an extreme warm winter. And then we had an extreme drought in the summer of 2012. Those are examples of weather variability. Um, you can't necessarily point to those and say that's climate change. So those, those events may become more frequent with climate change. So, so that's they, the difference they, between events and actual climate change. So that event may become a more regular part of the pattern, but right now it's too soon to tell. That's right. And but you have some research to, that is kind of saying that we're going in that direction of warmer. That's right. We've had some studies such as Chris Kuchark and Sloan Serbin did a study from 1950 to present looking at um, weather data throughout Wisconsin collected by residents of the state. And that's showing that um, the state has modestly warmed about 1.1 degrees since 1950s. Um, that small change has actually produced a substantial change in the growing season. It's lengthened it by a couple of weeks. So for us gardeners, that's, that's kind of a good thing. That's right. There are some good things and there's some bad things. Some of the other favorable things besides the warming is that it's gotten wetter, about three inches more rain a year, particularly in the autumn. Um, but then it's uh, associated with that, there's changes in weather extremes. We have the lengthening of the growing season by a, a month that's occurred. Um, that's been favorable. Well, um, and you said that there were some observations made by um, Aldo Leopold, in fact, right. that, that supports the climate change. Yes. Um, not only do we have the weather data, we have the impacts. Um, this is what's called phenology data, which is birds and plants timing spring events when mm -hmm. they emerge. And uh, Aldo ne Leopold Bradley back in the um, 30s and 40s was collecting data on the timing of these events of birds and um, plant blooming in southern Wisconsin. And later in the back of the 70s to 90s, then his daughter Nina collected the same data in the same oh, wow. region and found that a lot of these events are occurring roughly three weeks earlier. So it's already emerging and having effects on our so, so environment. Then you can look at that as some, I mean, it's still not 100 year, years of, of data, but you, you can say that, yeah, climate change is happening based on that kind of information? Yeah, that information definitely supports it. And I've also done a study on plant hardiness zones and the plant hardiness zones, which you'll often see on the back of seed packets, tell you what kind of plants will grow in an environment. It's based on the coldest temperature of the year. Mm -hmm. And usually our plant hardiness zones range from 3B in northern Wisconsin to 5B around Milwaukee County. Um, we're projecting by the end of the century, potentially that the um, Milwaukee County can even approach 7A category, wow. which is more anywhere from central in Illinois to um, central or northern Mississippi type plants. So in some ways, this is a good thing because there's a lot more plants we can grow and grow them longer. But then I also think of certain plants like uh, peonies that need a cold, a certain amount of cold to, to bloom, to grow. So we may lose some of the plants at the northern edge and, and birches 
that are at its southern edge may retreat further north too. Yeah, so we can have substantial uh, changes in our gardens. And we know through the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, we've developed climate projections for our state, such as six degrees warming wow. and changes in weather extremes. Now, the changes in weather extremes are the ones the gardeners you really have to be concerned about, such as... You an can't predict them, for one thing. That's right, <laughs> and they have large impacts on the garden. So the, gar the growing season might lengthen by a month, but we may have roughly three weeks more 90-degree days by the mid-21st century. Oh, I don't like that. That's right, <laughs> and more frequent summertime droughts and drier soils. So some of these can have direct effects on our garden, so we may have to mulch more often, uh, we may have to plan for invasive species, which may spread in with warmer temperatures. And well, invasive species, I'm assuming uh, insects coming up from the south, probably new diseases as well. That's as right. This all... That's right. So, so as, as gardeners, it sounds like we're going to have to adapt. You mentioned mulching, more watering, mm -hmm. being aware of these things coming up to, at us. Are there, are there other things we can do? That's right. With, in dealing with climate change, the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change impacts has really pushed adaptation, which is adjusting to the climate change, lessening negative effects by adapting to your um, change. There's also mitigation where you reduce emissions. In terms of adaptation, if you go to our website, we have some examples on how to adapt to climate change. So there are things to, we can do to, to help. That's right. We will have a direct link to your website. So thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Isn't this lush and tropical looking? It's not what Wisconsin looks like yet, and let's hope it's not gonna be that way for a while. We're at DC Smith Greenhouse on the UW-Madison campus, and I am with Dr. Laura Jull, Woody Ornamental Plant Specialist for the UW Extension. And uh, 2012 has been an exciting year for woody plant lovers in, in many ways. Uh, we have a, a couple new things to talk about. Yeah, well, Shelley, we have a new USDA plant cold hardiness zone map. And this new map was put out by USDA Agriculture Research Service as well as Oregon State University. And it's based on 30 years worth of data. Um, it's more accurate than the previous yeah. map because there are more weather stations involved and throughout the country that were used, as well as it takes into account GIS technology and differences in elevation um, and grade changes. So it's a lot more accurate. You can actually type in your zip code and really? it will tell you specifically what your cold hardiness zone is for your area. Now that's kind of neat because I've always argued that I'm colder than Madison. Now I can actually look it up on the mm -hmm. map and prove it or mm -hmm. find out that I'm totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Now the biggest question is has this map changed from the previous one? Yes, it has actually. In fact, most of Wisconsin is one half cold hardiness zone warmer than Warm. what it was, yes. Okay. Um, previously, South Central Wisconsin was zone 4B. Now we're zone 5A. But I wouldn't run out to the store and try growing bananas in your yard. <laughs> well, would, would you take this as indication of climate change since it's over a 30-year period yeah, of studies? Yeah, I would. I mean, we're definitely getting warmer. There's no question about that. And we, as gardeners, we need to adjust accordingly. And selecting plants that are more heat tolerant as well as drought tolerant, um, as well as non-invasive and pest resistant is really important. And this year, I actually did my own personal evaluations of, and I was amazed at what plants really did well through this drought. So 20, the year of uh, the drought of 2012, we learned something good from? Yes, we actually <laughs> did. Uh, there are a number of plants that I saw that were very drought tolerant. Our, our some of our natives, like mm -hmm. uh, Calm St. John's wort, Hypericum. Uh, the other one is Aronia, or chokeberry. Oh, highly uh, ornamental and yes. edible. Um, yep. Uh, another one was our native eastern nine bark, especially the dwarf or purple leaf cultivars were mm -hmm. quite drought tolerant. Uh, Wygelia is another one that's not native, but it's uh, showed great drought tolerance as well, and a number of other plants. So, so in any case, uh, even though we're half zone warmer, you also said don't just run out and, and yeah. buy the first thing you see that's a, does you know a half a zone warmer. 
do some research, be intelligent. Um, it, something I hear again and again is also buy local. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of buying local from local nurseries or garden centers that either you know grow their own plants or buy local plants and then re-sell um, them. I, I'm, some of the big box stores that I, I've actually been into are selling plants that really aren't cold hardy here. They actually have regional buyers and they buy for the entire Midwest. Well, the Midwest includes about four or five different cold hardiness zones. Right, it's a, and it's so, a big area. Yeah, and so I always say buyer beware. Do some research on your own, um, looking plants up. But um, if you buy from a local nursery source, they know what's really hardy or not. Well, and even buying local, um, you talked about drought tolerant plants and some of these that are really drought tolerant. If we don't establish them well, they're still going to just curl up and die. Oh, yes. You have to make sh sure they're well established before they're truly drought tolerant. Even some of the most drought tolerant plants, if you don't water them the first couple of years okay. on a regular basis, they will die. So a tree needs two or three years to get established, yeah, it's, then it can be drought tolerant. Yeah, it depends on the size of the tree you put in. They, in. For this part of the country, generally one inch caliper tree or the diameter of the tree when you plant it equals one year of uh, transplant uh, it needs to be able to establish. For shrubs, it's about the same, about two to three years. Okay. So, and we'll have a list of these, these plants that you learned about in 2012. And so people need to remember to water and uh, let them get established and buy local. Absolutely. Just like we do with our food. Yep. Thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. <music> Plants and temperatures aren't the only things that uh, change as a result of climate change. Insects are going to become more interesting as the, the climate continues to change. We are at D.C. Smith Greenhouse at the Horticulture Building on the University of Wisconsin-Madison campus on a very busy street corner. I am with UW Extension entomologist Phil Pelletieri, and we're talking insects and climate change. Um, to, first, we should talk about the year 2012, which was kind of, we hope, an anomaly. And yet, from what I hear, as c climate change continues, temperature extremes from horrendous rain to horrendous drought and high temperatures like we had in 2012 may become more normal, may become more frequent. And that, that caused some interesting issues with insects, didn't yeah, it? I, it was definitely, I, to be honest, the most ins insect specimens I've ever seen in a year in the lab. And th the dynamics there, things started early. We had very strong southerly air flows. And so we had a month extra growing season, but really what was more interesting is what came up in the, in the, the spring winds. And so we saw a number of insects from down south, uh, insects that attack uh, Baptisia, it's called the Genista broom moth, and it turns out it's a Texas moth. It's something I from normally don't, don't normally see established up here. Uh, we had big flights of cutworms come up here. The other interesting thing is insects that we were used to having one generation a year tried a second generation. Something like the squash vine borer uh, took advantage of the longer growing season. So you see that short term effect because of the dramatic changes and of course the drought. Um, lots of spider mites, things like false chinch bug. I haven't seen that insect since 1988. Wow. Uh, and it showed the last up. Last drought. <laughs> right. You know, so the climate affected that. Uh, but what is kind of interesting is then looking at the longer term effects. And, and that's somewhat different because. Uh, the dynamics there have more to do with the lack of cold weather in the winter and the kind of creatures that are, are doing quite well because of that. Well, curious then, some of these, uh, these critters that flew up because of climate change, they might be able to survive and stay here? Yeah, it depends on the critter. Uh, you know, some of them, you know, if you're normally established in Florida and can't get north of there normally, I, I don't think the we're, winters will take care okay. of those. Uh, but I think the dynamic we're seeing, and I, I tease sometimes the governor moved us to Missouri and didn't tell us, but uh, <laughs> the, the extended ranges of southern insects that normally were central Illinois now are well into the central part of Wisconsin. Okay. So I can give you some examples of that. Yeah. I mean, some of them are good. I mean, it's oh, well, not everything is a pest. <laughs> Um, this creature is called a, a giant swallowtail, and it's giant beautiful. swallowtails are endemic to Wisconsin. They breed on prickly ash, which we have quite a bit in the western edge of the state. But historically, if you got some decent cold weather in the winter, they didn't do very well. And so you might find some summers are very hard to find. 
doesn't seem to be that way anymore. They really are quite common, and I equate it to basically the high survival rates of the chrysalises because of the lack of significant cold weather. So they're overwintering just fine. Just fine, and so okay. that, you know that's that's kind of a fun one. Another one that really is kind of interesting to talk about are the praying mantids, oh, and there are I no native mantids to Wisconsin, years. and. It turns out there's two exotic species. One's from China, the Chinese mantid, and one's from Europe called the, the European mantid. And they have one generation a year, and the way they try to get through the winter is as an egg case, and it looks a little bit like a golf ball, it's kind of spongy. And historically, why it couldn't survive is they'd freeze out. Okay. And so we had no established populations until about the last 10 years. Now we know for a fact that we've got breeding populations in the southern third of the state and up in Door County. And wow. it's purely because they're surviving the winter. And the real reason behind that is the lack of 30 below and some of these other temperatures that really were quite commonplace at one time, but we just don't see them anymore. Well, and another neat new insect that you and I have talked about are the giant cicada killer wasps that look scarier than all get out, but aren't going to harm us. Right. And those were That's here. something that, again, as, as a young entomologist, it was something I'd find in Indianapolis, but you just barely saw any records here. And now they're so well established in, in the southern part of the state. In fact, we had, you know, in the past have done a, done a little piece on that, just kind of getting people used to what that, that creature stop, is about. So they'd stop running in terror because they're like about yay big. Right. Now, another interesting one to look at, there's an insect called the Euonymus caterpillar. Uh, it is a European insect, um, and it attacks burning bush and wahoo and other things in the genus Euonymus. Spring insect, um, it makes a lot of webbing. And the first records we had were in the 80s out of Waukesha. Uh, but what we would see if you had a significant cold snap in the winter, the little critters that overwinter as first instar larvae on the bark died. And okay. so I didn't see it move very Not much. Well, you get a couple much. mild winters and it'd get to Madison. I saw it north of the Dells. Four years ago, somebody sent me a picture from Duluth of a burning bush hedge totally stripped and defoliated. Wow. And so again, if that doesn't argue the lack of cold weather allowing insects to migrate farther north, uh, I mean, that's a classic example of that situation. Okay, I'm really happy now. Then I think I'm just going to keep moving as far north as I can go just to get rid of the insects. But you, you also have one you wanted to mention that's not tied in with climate change, but you kind of want people to be on the lookout for. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the next big pest critter is something called a marmorated stink bug. And it's a brown stink bug. And what's confusing is we have native brown stink bugs here already. I was going to say, I've seen this. Yeah. Now, this I thing, haven't seen this one. Well, uh, hopefully not. <laughs> um, we have some small records of overwintering adults in three or four counties. But if you look what's happened out east, um, it has become a major pest from two directions. One, it is a major pest of fruits and vegetables where its feeding causes distortions and callousing and oh, great. In, in abortions of fruit, all kinds of things. But then the adults in the fall invades people's houses like Asian lady beetle has done in the past. And oh, so really great. that combination makes it a superstar and a super pest. And, and unfortunately, we expect this to continue to be more commonplace. It may take a few years to get to the levels that's been out in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, but it's coming. So a lot of things are coming, some good like the praying mantids, a lot not so great. So we just need to be on the lookout and, and be prepared. Yeah, and again, sometimes you, you kind of pretend that you moved 500 miles south because that's really what's starting to happen with the insect population. Great, so we can go swimming in November. Not. <laughs> okay, thanks, Phil. <laughs> We are at the UW-Madison Arboretum, probably not in one of their favorite spots because we are surrounded by a Canada thistle. And I am with Extension Weed Specialist Mark Renz to talk about Canada thistle and why it seems to be one of the few things that's happy about climate change. <laughs> yeah, this plant is really truly a, a unique plant. You know, not many people get excited about weeds, but I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, this is not thrilling me here. Yeah, and, and this plant is, is one of the few plants we actually know a lot of information about how climate change has already affected it and probably will affect it in the future. What's really unique about this plant is that what research has been done is documented that as CO2 levels increase, we're getting more above ground growth and below ground growth. So more shoots and roots. Oh goody. Yeah, and so that's really the problem is, is so 
Uh, in addition, that research has looked at management. It looks like management is going to become more difficult because of more shoot and more root growth. Well, I know that uh, standard practice is, is, you know, roundup for many people because this is just a real bear to get rid of. Yeah, and actually that's what the research evaluated was the use of glyphosate as the active ingredient in Roundup. And what they found is that it was less effective at controlling the plant. What it did is it killed the same amount of root tissue as it typically would, but there was just so much more root, so tissue. Much more root tissue, exactly. So more of the plant, less effective. What does that do for, for organic gardeners who are trying to, I assume, just pull it? Yep, so they're left with pulling, mechanical management, physical management, mowing, and it's really difficult, really a struggle. A lot of our organic growers, and I know of one or two that's actually gone out of business because of canned thistle, because wow. it's so difficult to manage. We don't recommend composting it, which many of them try to do, because this perennial root that we're holding in our hands here can actually re-sprout and re-root and cause an invasion uh, in that population to exist. So really a difficult plant to manage. We know it's a problem in urban areas as well as ag lands and also natural areas like this. Like so this. truly a problem. Just about everywhere. Yep. Well, and are there other weeds that are happy about climate change? Yeah, a lot of our weeds unfortunately are going to probably do better from climate change. I think two that I'd like to highlight would be garlic mustard and wild parsnip. Oh, great. You know, we've recently we've had an early warm up in the spring, some really erratic behavior. And it seems like garlic mustard really took advantage of that. Populations just blossomed this year. It's really dominant in the south. We're gonna, it's spreading north. It's probably gonna spread even farther to the north. We're seeing it in full sun habitats where we haven't seen oh, it in those areas right. in the past. It used to be shade mostly. Yeah, and so we're really concerned about that one. Wild parsnip is another one that's spreading rapidly in the east and the north. We know this well from the south. So we're really gonna to need to be on the lookout. Those are probably gonna be players that, in the future. Uh, what about buckthorn? That's one that I, is a pain. Yeah, buckthorn, I kind of say, we already lost the war on <laughs> right. that one too. It really has these huge massive thickets. There are a couple areas that are re relatively free of buckthorn, but that one really does well in our environment. It's up north of us and so, and to the south of us. So I predict it's probably gonna to continue to really thrive as our climate changes. So you guys are gonna to have to change your maps entirely, basically, because everything's gonna spread. Right, and that's one of our concerns. When our lab, one of the things we do is we do predictive modeling to predict where these spread. And one of the big tools we look at is how the climate ch is. But as that climate exactly. changes, we're gonna to have to redo all our maps. And so that's Aww. a lot more work we're gonna to have to do too. <laughs> well, are there, these are weeds that are already here in Wisconsin. And most of us are somewhat familiar with some of these. Yeah. Are there new weeds that we might not even know are coming? Yeah, there's actually two I wanna highlight. We're most concerned about the weeds coming from the south. We mm -hmm. get them from the north and the south usually. From the south, the, um, the first one that we're concerned about is a plant called kudzu, or the, or the weed or plant that ate the south. Heard of it, yes. <laughs> it's, it's relatively close to the Wisconsin border and really? just south of Chicago, and so we're concerned about it moving in there. It's been documented in Canada as well, wow. to the south of us. So it's probably a matter of time before we get that one. We're really actively looking for that to try and find it. And you said two. Yeah, and then the other one we're concerned about is a plant called Japanese stiltgrass. It's an annual grass, like crabgrass in our gardens, but instead of growing in full sun, grows in shaded conditions like understories of forests and creates a canopy of just grass in that understory, displacing the native plants. Animals don't like it and don't do as well in that habitat and also is changing the soil ecosystem and potentially the fire uh, disturbance regime. So increase of fire is because of this dry grass as an under is an understory yep. basically. Yep, so it dries out right about now mm. and much more fuel than would typically be in many of our systems and so we might get that, that those forests burning much more frequently than so, in the past. All sorts of problems. Yep. So so what do we do? I mean, I'm hearing gloom and doom. Is there anything we as, as gardeners and homeowners can do? I think there are and I think the, the, the two points I'd like to point out is one, educate yourself. Okay, we have know, know your enemy. That's right, we have lots of resources in Extension and DNR and others have lots of resources to help with identification. And we'll have a link to your website to help Great. with that. That would be wonderful. So know what those are. And then if you think you might see something, tell someone. Okay, I don't care if it's don't a keep it a secret. That's right, I don't care if it's a county <laughs> agent, someone from DNR, some other person that can get the word out so we can go in and try and conduct some management on an early detection basis. And if you're wrong, that's okay. We'd rather have uh, that information be wrong than have you not share that information with Rather us. than have kudzu be the vine that ate the north. Exactly. Thanks, Mark. Sure, my pleasure.
We'll have more information as well as the new cold hardiness map on our website. Just go to WPT.org, then click on the Wisconsin Gardener. I'm Shelley Ryan. Thanks very, very much for watching the Wisconsin Gardener. Funding for the Wisconsin Gardener is provided in part by the Wisconsin Master Gardener Association.